to find it, I guess just go to the syllabus and I am going to work in our markdown. I still want to remind you that you don't have to. Uh, and if it's difficult, just don't. Um, and the reason I'm working in our markdown is because most of you are. Um, so I guess it, it makes the most sense um, for me too as well. But you don't have to. Uh, and if you're getting bugs and it's really difficult, um, yeah. I strongly recommend if you do work in R Markdown, and is that if you do work in R Markdown, don't do this thing that I've seen a lot of students doing, which is like putting code in bit by bit and sort of testing that code uh, by highlighting it and running it, but not by knitting. Um, I'm finding that students that do that end up with a lot of errors that come up when you knit, but don't come up before you knit. So what I want you to do if you're working in Markdown is when you add new code, re-knit it. So like every time you're adding stuff, you can re-knit it. And that's not a, a, a smart or efficient way to work, uh, but for the purposes of this course, it's fine because our code is simple and it doesn't. It only takes half a second for R to rerun all of it. But literally what R Markdown is going to have to do is rerun all your code just to test each new line of code. Uh, but I recommend that because you don't want to like be working on it, thinking that it all works. Then you have to submit it in five minutes. So you go to knit and you find that it's not knitting uh, and you've got issues. So constantly be knitting, always be knitting. So I downloaded it and it's here. It's in my downloads. What I'm going to do is move it to my desktop, uh, create a new, um, create a new folder call it lab five and just move that markdown folder. Um, yeah, just really like you need to stay on top of where these files are, especially markdown files, um, because to load data, they need to be in the same place or you need to use the entire, um, the entire file path. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to delete PDF document and word document because I want to knit to HTML document. And I recommend you do the same. I just think that there's going to be less issues, less bugs, less problems if you're knitting to HTML. OK. Problem one, continuous categorical problems. First, import the class data set. If you're doing this lab in Markdown, make sure you import the data using the read CSV function in Markdown. So let's do that uh, as a first step. I mean, first of all, I guess just knit, right? Like, let's knit it before we make any changes. Um, if you have a problem doing that, you're probably one of the people that shouldn't be using R Markdown. There's probably like things not installed in your computer that need to be installed. There's some kind of issue. Uh, basically the raw Markdown file, if that doesn't knit for you, you know, it's uh, Markdown may not be for you. So through no fault of your own, by the way. Um, okay. So... I want to uh, read in the data set, so I'm just copying and pasting um, this empty R chunk that's given to us at the top. Um, we, own, we don't need a lot of this, so I'm just going to delete everything in the squiggly brackets except the R, and I'm going to delete um, the knitter options, which, to be honest with you, I don't even know what that does, uh, but I know that we don't need it. Um, so first step is to read in the data set. Like I was saying before, you can um, do this a couple of ways. The easiest way is just to make sure that the class data set is in uh, the, the same folder that your markdown is in, that your markdown file is in. So I've just sort of copied the class data set that I had for lab three. Now we're going to use it for lab five and put it in that lab five folder where the markdown is. And now I can just load it in by just saying read.csv putting quotation marks, press tab, there it is, uh, and that'll load. And if I just want to check it, I can say head, class, and because I've added something new, now I want to knit, just to check that this works. So knit it, looks like it worked fine. Um, but this is always a source of problems. Um, and it seems to me that the problems usually come from students not really knowing where their markdown file is, 
not really knowing where the class data set is, <coughs> downloading the class data set without the .csv, like writing the wrong name of the class data set for some reason. Um, there's a, yeah, there's a, like it's always just, seems to me one of the most difficult things when you're starting with R is loading data. Um, so yeah, take a few moments, uh, try to get it to knit with the data set and this head command. Um, and hopefully you'll be looking at something like this. And I guess change your name goes here, that part at, your to at the top. So I'm going to say for knit. If you're having problems with this step, ask your neighbor. I'll give you guys like 2.3 more minutes to get the data loaded because there's always problems. And if you want, put up your hand and I'll come. But I can not help everybody. Are you using Markdown, Ion? No. Good. <laughs> I wouldn't. If I was you, I wouldn't. So Ayana's using like this cloud, this R cloud computing thing, which is just this different way of doing things. So yeah, I wouldn't use Markdown if I was you. It works with Yeah. But you have the class data set in your cloud already, right? So that should be pretty easy to load it again. All right. So hopefully most of you have that code knitting. Um, and then there's this part, find a buddy in your discussion section. Okay, so there's a lot here, let's go through it. With your buddy, choose one continuous variable to predict. So you're gonna choose a continuous dependent variable. Uh, and it also says, do any variable creation slash data cleaning necessary to work with this continuous variable? So if we choose something from a scale, the lab is asking us to do the data cleaning necessary to compute the um, the scale score. Don't just use the single variable, right? So there's all sorts of stuff in the class data set that is uh, a scale. Um, uh, the code book, you can just go to that and have a look. There is a, there's a satisfaction with life scale. There's, what are the other things? Memes. Attitudes towards capitalism, what? Memes. Memes, is that a scale? Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of scales. So you're gonna choose something you and your buddy, collectively. Hopefully you'll come to a consensus about what you want to use as the continuous variable. I'm going to use um, openness. The three openness items. So we've got one reversed item. Uh, and let's just go through again how to um, create the scale score. So. With your buddy, choose one continuous variable, blah, 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 do any variable creation. Okay, so I'm just going to put a code chunk right below this first paragraph um, just by copying and pasting my old code chunk and deleting the code in it. Um, so I choose openness. Openness, one in, that looks better. Um, so I, yeah, so the professor's shown you like one way to do this, to take reversed items and sort of flip them. Um, I, it's, it's, it's fine to do it that way. And I, and I guess like it really complicates things to be shown multiple ways of, of doing things. Like there's a, there are much more efficient ways to do it, I guess is what I'm saying, but it's fine to use an inefficient way that, that works. So let's just uh, stick with the professor's method, uh, which is basically to create um, multiple standalone um, data frames, right? So we first we go data frame, and then we can say class dollar sign. Uh, I think it's O O one, O two, and O three R. O one class dollar sign. O2, oh no, but this is positively keyed items, right? So open.pos, I'm going to create um, 
$1.01 and $1.02. At this point, I'm realizing it's going to be easier for me to like write this code if I actually bring in the data set to my environment, which I haven't done yet, right? Um, if you just knit an, an, a markdown file, you don't actually load the data into your RStudio environment. To do that, all I need to do is just highlight that code and run it. And you see sort of class appear up there. So now that I've got it, it's just going to be easier to do this kind of stuff because now, say I do dollar sign, I can just choose these variables from here. So data frame class 01, class 02, and that'll create open positive items, open negative items, it's just going to be 03R, right? Class 03R. Um, We'll create open neg. Then we need to reverse it, bless you. Um, so to reverse it, we need to know what the scale it's on. Um, so I'm just going to ask um, for a summary of open neg. It looks like it's a one to five scale, which I think is the case for um, most of these variables. So then we can just go six minus open neg. Um, I may want to give that a different name too. So neg.r um, means that a negative item is reversed, which means positively keyed. So that'll um, reverse them. Then we just need to um, put them all together. So open will just be data frame of combining the positive items and the reversed negative items. And then I'm going to create the scale score openness. I'm and use row means. So it's row means of open. And generally we want to say na.rm equals true, um, which basically just means if somebody just has data on one or two of these items, we're not going to throw away that data. Uh, yeah, question. Oh yeah, right. That's no, that's a bug. That's what I meant to write. So class, I'm adding it to the class data set. Yeah, my mistake. So this should uh, knit. Uh, I guess the um, a way to test it would just be to ask for a summary, or maybe even a histogram of the variable that we, we've created. So um, just to sort of test that what we've done has worked given us the kind of result that we want. I'm just going to create a histogram. I'm going to see if this knits. And I think this would be a good spot for all of you to just check if what you've done is knitted. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm pretty sure there's two ends in openness. I'm kind of blanking on that now. Not a great spell. What is the row means again? Row means? That is calculating their average across those three openness items, right? So for every row, every row has a score on openness one, openness two, and openness three. Row means is getting the mean of that row of those three questions, which is their score on the openness scale. Yeah. Okay. So I've chosen openness. I've made my scale score. Uh, I'm ready to move on to choosing independent variables, I believe. Okay, so look through the code book. Choose one continuous variable you think might predict this dependent variable and one categorical variable with only two levels that you think might explain this dependent variable. Explain, predict, we mean the same thing. You and your buddy should each choose different IVs with the goal of trying to find the variables that make the best predictions of this variable, right? Okay, so I'm trying to predict openness I think, mm, I'm going to say attitudes towards capitalism will predict this, and that'll be a continuous predictor. Um, but I'm not, I'm going to focus on the categorical side of things for now. Um, I smoke pot? Sure. Smoke dot pot. I'm going to predict openness from smoking pot. This will be interesting. So, 
this, I think smoking pot is a categorical predictor, but let me just check. Uh, I missed a line there. So sort of re copying that R chunk down there just to get these, just to get an R chunk going. Um, let me just ask for a summary of class smoke pot. And what I'm hoping to see is it's a um, binary dependent variable. Yes, it is. Great. But you know what? I want to, I want to choose a different one because this one's kind of perfect and doesn't require any attention or any data cleaning. So I know for a fact that um, Love Beyonce um, needs some attention. So if we choose um, Love Beyonce, we can see that there's actually it's a no or yes uh, variable, but there's a, there's a third level here. One person responded just blank. They didn't respond no or yes, right? So we have to um, we have to take care of this. We really have to just make that person um, an NA in our data, right? So the way to do this is, yeah, this is sort of a special thing we need to do if it's a categorical variable like this. We not not only need to make the person NA, but we need to remove the the level of the categorical variable. Uh, and the way we do this is sort of given to it, the, us in this um, markdown file. Um, so the professor said we can do this, but I mean, th that needs to be number one. So yeah, so basically let me take you through step by step what's going on. So levels is a command, uh, oh, data variable. Levels is a command that tells us the levels of a categorical variable. And here we can see that the first one is this blank level, and then we've got no or yes, right? So we can use um, indexing to focus on a single one of these levels, right? So if I just do square brackets one, now I'm just calling the first level of Love Beyonce. And now if I set that level to be NA, what you'll see is I just basically delete that level. So now if I ask for the levels again, it tells me there's just two levels, no or yes. So if I knit this, scroll down, it looks good, right? I had, these, I had this other level that was like an error or just like an NA. I've sort of removed it. And now if I ask for the levels, it's just no or yes, which is what I want. However, this code got a lot of my students in the earlier class in trouble because I mean, if I run this line 34 again, what's going to happen? It's going to delete the no. Yeah, yeah. It's going to delete the level no, uh, and I'll be left with just the yeses and this categorical variable with no <laughs> variation that I can't use. So a lot of people did that. I did tell them not to do it, but a lot of people still did it. So, like, maybe you guys will not do it. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. But the, uh, the way to like prevent that for sure um, is you can, be a, you can sort of be a bit clever about this. And you can say, you can actually in the indexing specify only delete the level if the level is empty quotation marks, right? Uh, so that'll, when there is a level that's empty quotation marks, it will delete that level. When, the, when it's already gone, it won't do anything. Um, so that's kind of a like foolproof way if you have this line of code. And it quite often, often happens with coding that there's like a, a, a sort of a radioactive line of code that you really have to run just once. And if you run it more than once, it's going to like cause problems. Um, but this is sort of safeguarding against that to um, sort of use this uh, indexing with this uh, logical command. Now it's returning false, false, right? But if I had that level, it would return true, false, false. Uh, let me just demonstrate. If I reload the class data set, redo openness, um, ask for a summary, I've still got that level I want to remove. Right now, this code returns that level because that level exists. And this command returns true, false, false. Uh, once I've run this once, though, now that level is gone, um, and but this will return like just false, false. So the level's gone, it won't get applied, 
Uh, this thing will not find any level. Yeah. Anyway, um, you don't need to do that. You can just say one, uh, but you just need to be very, very careful not to run this line of code more than once because it'll screw up the data. And, and when you knit, it'll be fine, right? Because when you knit, it runs through all your code and it only runs through it once. And when you knit, you reload the data set. So it's, it'll be totally fine to knit it. But when you're trying to test your code, you're going to get errors and stuff like that. Okay. So I'm going to use Love Beyonce or no, I was going to use Smokepot. And I can still use Smokepot now because I've showed you how to clean this variable. So like uh, how to clean categorical variable. Um, so yeah, so now we have to, you and your buddy should each choose different IVs with the goal of trying to blah, blah, blah. Okay. But there's a bunch of stuff we have to do, right? So the first thing we're asked to do is graph your variables and make sure there are no outliers, um, or issues with the categorical variables. So let's say I chose, uh, I don't know, Facebook friends as my continuous variable. How would I graph it? What would be the easiest way to graph a single continuous variable. Histogram. Histogram. Great. Perfect. So I just go hist class dollar, whoop, dollar sign Facebook friends. Uh, just knit it to see that graph. Scroll down. There it is. I mean, this person's an outlier. Maybe I want to remove them. Maybe I don't. But that's that's kind of up to you in a way. But what about, how would I plot the um, smoke pot variable? Plot. plot, great. Plot class dollar sign smoke pot. Let's knit it again. See what happens. Plot just gives you this basic plot showing you um, counts basically. So about, you know, 120 people said no and about 40 people said yes. All right, so graph your variables, make sure there's no outliers. I'm going to ignore the outliers for now because that was all sort of previous labs. You guys know how to do that. Um, now we need to plot the relationship between the two variables. Uh, use the plot function for the model for the continuous IV and the plot means function for the model with the categorical IV. So um, now we're actually going to use plot for the... Um, continuous predictor, so openness uh, tilde Facebook friends data equals class. That should work. That should just give us a basic uh, scatter plot. Let me knit just to make sure. Yep, there's my scatter plot. And it sort of looks like there's a relationship. I've still got that outlier, which is going to do a lot of kind of heavy listing in terms of determining the statistical relationship. So maybe you do want to remove that outlier. I don't know. Um, I want to be clear that it's not a mistake not to remove that outlier, right? There's no clear rule telling us you have to remove that data point because it's away from the rest of your data, right? It's, yeah. And I... I guess I wouldn't really recommend removing it. Um, uh, for your final projects, I think the, the data you should remove is the data that you're clear was some kind of mistake, right? If so, say somebody said their age was 1,000 or that they have 5,000 Facebook friends, which I don't think you're allowed to. So like, but just because somebody said they had 2,500 Facebook friends, I mean, I kind of believe them. And I think that the data point came from the population that I'm interested in making generalizations to. So I don't really see a statistical justification for removing it. Anyway, that's probably going into too much depth. Anyway, so to plot the, um, the relationship between uh, the categorical independent variable and the continuous dependent variable, we need to use plot means. Now, plot means comes from um, a specific library. Um, and it's actually called the gplot library. So we're going to need to call it in our markdown script in order to make this graph. Now you may not have this package installed. If not, uh, if I was you, I'd just install it from an R script because you really never want to have um, the install packages command in a markdown file. I mean, it's fine to do it in the markdown file if you're very careful and you remove that code, but 
like again the foolproof way just do it from an R script hopefully it works uh, I know some students are having uh, problems downloading and installing packages um, it's often related to like your permissions so are you like an administrator uh, or not um, and it gets a bit complicated and yeah but hopefully yeah if you run install packages you'll have installed the package uh, I'd go back to my markdown library gplots and then it's just going to be plot means um, and then we're just going to put um, sort of the same formula approach so dependent variable tilde independent variable um, and that should just work uh, so let's try it and that's what it looks like so yeah um, people that said yes looked like they were slightly higher than people that said no however they're not very much higher like look at the y-axis right 3.4 to 3.8 so just by default plot means is really going to zoom in on your mean difference um, I mean it does give you these bars that indicate sort of the error of those estimates so you can sort of see that this is probably not a significant difference but just because it zooms in it'll always make look like there's like a difference between the groups even if that difference is very minimal as is the case here it's like 3.5 to 3.6 um, not much difference at all so that's cool that worked for the uh, <coughs> plotting the relationships so now we just need to fit the models okay easy so for each model define the linear model uh, using the LM function and print the coefficients for the model um, go ahead and add the model line for the continuous graph you do not need to add the line for the categorical model and interpret the intercept and slope from the model what does the intercept and slope tell you how do the intercept and slope relate to the graph yada yada okay so we're fitting models luckily we already have a lot of the code that we need right so it's going to be um, we're going to say our Facebook mod is this guy with an LM in front of it and then I guess we should ask for the, a summary of the Facebook mod um, and then the let's say the pot mod is going to be this guy with an LM in front of it and then we can ask for a summary of the pot mod then uh, yeah we are asked to sort of put the regression line on the Facebook mod uh, plot so let's just grab that code from up here because you know it's we've moved on we're in a new R chunk we can't put a line on a, a graph that was like further up in our, our markdown so we need to like create the graph again and then it's just gonna be a B line FB mod we'll put that oops It'll put that line on our graph. I'm just going to make it red because I always do. And I don't know why, but I just do. Okay. So these are our models. These are our summaries. This is not all you have to do. I mean, you also have to interpret the intercept and slope, but I can't do that till I've seen them. So let's knit it so we can actually see our intercepts and slopes. Okay. So first off, Facebook mod, LM, openness, tilde Facebook friends. We've asked for a summary of the model. And who wants to have a go at interpreting the intercept and slope from this model? Julie? Mm. Well, what does the intercept always mean? Like, we talked about it earlier. The y-intercept? Yeah. So intercept is predictive value of y when... Well, when... Predictive value of y when it's zero. Exactly. 
So when x is 0, what does that mean in the case of this model? What's x here? Yeah. So if Facebook friends is 0, it means somebody has 0 Facebook friends, right? So our intercept is what the model predicts for uh, the openness of somebody with 0 Facebook friends. Right. But what about the slope? What, is this, what does the slope tell us? Yeah, exactly. It gives us that uh, regression line, right? So our model predicts for each additional Facebook friend, so for a one unit change in X, we predict a 0 0.0003 change in Y. We predict that you'll have three ten thousandths more higher score in terms of points on this openness scale. And that's not much, right? But like I said, you got to think about the scale. So even though that is a very small number, it's still statistically significant uh, because this variable, Facebook friends, doesn't just change by one unit, two unit, like it's different by thousands between people, right? So did you have a question? Yeah. Okay. Somebody had a question? Yeah. I saw something. Anyway, yeah. So the intercept is predicted openness for somebody with zero Facebook friends. Slope is predicted change in openness for each additional Facebook friend that you have. Um, here's, what our, here's what that looks like on the graph. Uh, at just a gradual sort of slope. If we remove this outlier, we might not get a positive slope at all. Uh, but we might. We'll see. You'll see. Okay, the pop mode. Now this is different. Now we have categorical independent variables. So notice what... Yeah, so pay a bit of attention to this. So we put in this categorical variable in the model and R automatically assigns a reference level and an alternative level based on um, alphabetical order. So like we were saying before, no's become zeros, yeses become ones, right? So when you look at these numbers, what does this tell you about the people who said no? to Smoky Pot and the people who said yes. Which group was higher on openness based on these model results? All right, so think about what x is in this case, right? Because like I said, mathematically, the slope is still the same thing. It's a predicted change in y for a one unit change in x. Here, x has become a dummy variable. And we know that yes is level 1 and no is level 0, right? So this slope here, 0.136, represents predicted change in y for a one unit change in x. Here, a one unit change in x just means going from you're a zero to you're a one, right? So it says, if you go from a zero to a one, if you go from a no to a yes, we predict that your openness increases by 1.36. So which group was higher on openness? Maddie? The ones who smoke what was that? The ones who smoke pot. The ones who smoke pot, the ones who said yes to that question. Uh, but like I was saying when we saw that graph, it doesn't look like it's a statistically significant difference. We don't get a significant p-value, but we're not even talking about p-values yet. We explain very little of the dependent variable though. So with the uh, Facebook friends model, our R squared was 0.04, um, which may not sound like much, but uh, you know, people make careers in psychology with uh, lower R squareds than that, trust me. Uh, and really the average effect size in psychology is not much greater than that. So like, it might not sound like much, but it's like, it's a detectable relationship. Here, we're explaining not even 1% of variance. Um, and hey, if you have a big enough sample, you can explain 0.6% of variance and get a significant result and publish a paper. And um, yeah, uh, I've done it. It's a weird feeling. But yeah, it's... Uh, 
yeah, the yes group's higher because we have a positive slope here. If it was a negative slope, it would suggest that going from zero to one, the prediction goes down. So the, the yes group is, would be lower. Okay. Well, it depends. Like for a continuous variable, it's still the predicted change in y for a one unit change in x. Um, but it can mean a very different thing, right? So here, like a one unit change in x just means a s one more Facebook friend, right? Which is not much, right? So which is why like we don't predict y to change very much, even though this is a significant effect, but the other right. But here, going from zero to one means being in this whole other category of people from when you said no to the people who said yes, right? So this is the predicted uh, change for a one unit change in X, which means like basically the difference between these two groups. Uh, and it's not significant, even though it's a bigger slope. Um, that's just because one of these variables is just zeros and ones. The other is numbers from very low to thousands, right? Uh, yeah, we'll talk about significance later in the semester. I don't want you to get too hung up on that yet. I shouldn't even be talking about it, so I apologize. Okay, so the next step is calculate R squared for each model. So I want to show you uh, what you, how you should do this. So when you, so R squared is, it's about looking at um, how much, how much variation in this variable is there overall? And after we fit our model, how much variation is there in the residuals, right? So if you think about it, a very, very good model will be like making really accurate predictions, right? So the residuals will be very, very small, and there'll be very little variation among the residuals uh, compared to the variation in the variable. A rubbish model really won't be doing much better than the mean, and so the variation of the residuals will be very similar to the variation in the model. So like, this is how we can sort of compare the sum of squares total, which is just deviations from the mean, to the sum of the squared residuals from the model, which is like the leftover errors after we've made our prediction. And if the leftover errors are very much smaller than the total variation, it means we've explained a lot of that total variation. But if the leftover errors are just as vari there's as, mu as much variation in those errors as there is in the total variable, we haven't explained much at all in terms of our model. So the model summary gives us um, summary like FB mod. The model summary gives us R squared, right? So we don't, uh, what did I call it? Oh, it doesn't think I've run it because I haven't run it in this code. So the summary of the model, it tells us R squared. And R squared for the Facebook model is 0.038, but we need to just sort of calculate it by hand, so to speak. So what I recommend you do is always use the data set that's stored in your model object. So what does that mean? So when, you, when we create a model object, we... So FB mod, for example, is my, oops, is my model object. Now, when you create a model object, it has various objects within it. Like, so it's an object, it's a list of different objects, right? And one of those objects, the model object, is actually just the, all the data that was used in your model. So if we ask for the head of FB mod dollar sign model, and we knit, we can see that our model contains its data, all the data that was used to fit the model. And the reason I want, or I highly recommend you use the data directly from the model object is because you will not have problems with NAs, right? If you try to calculate these statistics like R squared just with the data that comes like from the data set, you will almost inevitably encounter problems. For example, Let's say uh, I have like four missing cases in Facebook friends, but those, those cases have data for the variable openness, right? They're not going to be used in the linear model, 
So R just by default will sort of discard those cases before fitting the model. So the R squared value that I get from the model will have nothing to do with those four cases, right? So then when I go to calculate my R squared, if I am calculating my the total variability in that variable, just the openness variable with the one from the data set, I will take into account those four cases, right? Because they won't, they won't be deleted because now I'm just working with that variable from the data set. Okay, I can tell I'm losing people. Let me just show you what to do and just trust me that it's what you should be doing and it'll solve a lot of problems for you. So basically this is just a data set, FB mod dollar sign model, and we can use it like any data set. So to calculate the sum of squares total, we need to grab our Y variable, which for the FB mod is FB mod dollar sign model dollar sign Facebook friends. So now we're using dollar sign to call the model, so the model data set, and then dollar sign again to call the Facebook friends variable. So now that we've got our Y, we can get the deviations from the mean, which is going to be Y minus the mean of Y. Then we can square those, y devs 2, it's just going to be y devs squared. And then we can sum them. Uh, and that'll give us our SST, or our sum of squares from the mean model, um, just by using sum. right? So you can do all this like in a single step, if you're comfortable with coding. Um, but a good way to troubleshoot is just to break it down into simple steps. Uh, so we get our y variable, we calculate the deviations from the mean, we square those deviations from the mean, and then we sum those squared deviations from the mean, and that gives us our SST. 2 million, 200, no, 22 million, no, it's a big number. Uh, Wait, Facebook friends is not our Y variable. Okay, that was a test and you all failed. Openness <laughs> is our dependent variable. Um, yeah, that, that SST was just suspiciously large. Uh, so the sum of squared deviations of Facebook friends is much, much higher uh, than the sum of squared deviations of, uh, yeah, Greg. Can you explain where you got models from? Model? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So here, in this line of code, I create FB mod uh, by fitting a linear model predicting openness from Facebook friends. So you have to run that model for that object to appear in your environment, right? So now that that model exists, it's a linear model object, right? I can ask, what what is it? Class FB mod, and it should tell me LM model. It's an LM, right? It's a linear model object. It stores all the data that I used in an object inside itself, right? So if I go FB mod dollar sign, this is all the stuff that I've created by creating that FB mod. So one of the things that is stored inside a linear model object is this thing called model, which is just the data that I used. Now that I've, um, when I call that, I can then call specific variables from that data with another dollar sign, right? So FB mod dollar sign model dollar sign openness just gives me all the data for openness that I used when I fit FB mod. So if I run that all, you guys should get an SST of 60.64. But now we also need SSE. So SST is like I was saying, it's all the variation in this variable, right? Uh, before we fit the model, it's just how much the values deviate from the mean. SSE is the sum of squared residuals, so the errors from our model. So to get this, they basically, you can just get the residuals straight from the model object. And I think like it's kind of arguable uh, how much this is doing it by hand, but um, I'm, I'm fine with it. So what I'm going to do is just say fbmod dollar sign residuals because this is another object 
that's kind of stored inside the linear model object, and then square them, and then sum them, and that will give me the sum of squared errors, or the sum of squared residuals, uh, whatever you want to call it. I should get it, and it'll always be lower than SST. If you ever get an SSE that's higher than your SST, then you did something wrong. Um, question? Yeah, totally. So one of them is basically like, the SST is basically like the residuals from a model where you just use the mean to predict, right? So imagine like, this is our data. Imagine we just predict all that data from the mean of Y. So it's, the mean is about here and it's just a flat line for every case we predict the mean. Then the residuals are literally just each case's deviation from the mean. Right? So this is like SST. But the residuals from the model, oh my god, they just, whiteboard markers are the one thing. If we fit the model, we don't just use the mean, we use some x variable. Oh, so we've used Facebook friends to predict. So now the residuals are these guys. They're basically the difference between our prediction or our regression line and the true values of the data. So this SST is deviations from the mean. SSE is the sum of squared deviations from the regression line or from the prediction. What do they stand for? What's that? What do they stand for? The SST. Sum of squares total and sum of squared errors. So sometimes we say residuals, sometimes we say errors, but it means the same thing. So this is how I get my SSE. And then it's a very simple formula. Uh, to get my R squared, it's just SST minus SSE over SST. And then it should give us R squared, and then we can just use summary FB mod to check that we've calculated the correct R squared. Um, let me just knit this to check. It should be fine. Uh, yeah, it looks good. Um, calculate R squared. I've done that. My answer was 0.038. The summary of the model says 0.038. So it looks good. Uh, so just back to that code. I can tell people have not quite finished um, jotting it down. Okay. So I went a bit over time, but that's basically everything you need to do uh, for this lab. Um, for number one, you work with a buddy, choose a variable that you want to predict choose different independent variables, see whose variables better predict that uh, outcome, uh, email your code to your buddy, um, get their code from them, um, see if you can reproduce what they got, if they can reproduce what you got. Um, for problem two, it's just about trying to predict the stress variable and trying to choose the, the independent variables from the data set that best predict stress. And it's just using the class data set again. But everything you're doing in number two is pretty much the same. I guess at the end, there's this bit, finally identify the four reasons why you might have found this pattern, uh, which is what we were talking about earlier. Those four reasons you might observe a relationship between two variables. So there's a couple of students in this class who have been neglecting to write anything in their labs. I'm not naming any names, but I may start taking off marks if you um, ignore this part. So sometimes we need you to write stuff. It's not just all about code. Um, yeah. So yeah, for the rest of the time, make sure you get your buddy. Make sure you have each other's email. Um, start working through it all for yourselves. Um, if you're having bugs or you've been sitting there or you never even loaded the data, put up your hand. I'll come around. Um, but yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, so you're saying like just use what you did up there? Or just like use this and then just put it in the center? Said, I calculated SST and I stopped. Mm -hmm. Like I thought that was my R squared. Um, oh, right. So like the sum of squared residual is just like first we would need to get like y hat, which is all the predictive values, and they actually come from the model as well. So we can go fb mod 
fitted values. Oh wait, so this is what we were supposed to have done last week, because he didn't teach us how to call model objects. No, no. So he, I think he just used residuals from the model. How do you? Um, what does that mean? So this this guy here, FB mod dollar sign residuals, they are the all the errors from the model. So they're basically like. Um, the difference between each data point. So that we were supposed to call that for the last homework assignment? I think so. Um, yeah. Okay. So there was some example code in the I am um, the, the, exam the example code just calculates SSD. Yeah, so it does get this residuals as well, though. So like... Um, like the lecture code um, does exactly. So I copied it exactly from what the lecture code does, which is this. Mm -hmm. He calculates the residual, mm -hmm. but it's residual from the mean and not from the model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But mod dollar sign residuals oh, is gets, from the model. gets those residuals. So from mine is FB mod dollar sign residuals, but he's going, okay. yeah, so it's a different thing. But so that's what you do. You call FB mod dollar sign residuals. Mm -hmm. Okay. To get those errors. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. So I had some trouble when I was working on that board. So here, when I try to like combine the data frame together, it just tell me the the number of rows are not the same. Cool. So. ADF, BDF, CDF, No, DDF, we don't need BDF, to do this, but... Yeah, yeah. I, no, no, that's fine. I, like, but I just want to check piece by piece if this will all run. Uh, wait. This keyboard is weird. Command enter, right? Oh, shift enter. Ah. So this all runs, and we've got these guys. So then it's not letting you C bind them? Yes. Shift enter. Oh, no, that works. Oh, so, and then, yeah, it looks fine. But I couldn't make it work like last week, and I made it. Uh, I wonder why. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, here we got a problem. Uh, error in model. Well, one problem here is that, I mean, does, is sleep deprivation a variable in this data set? I think I created Let's see, let's class. So if we just say class dollar sign sleep deprivation, what do we get? No, so it doesn't have the sleep deprivation variable yet. So we need to like create that. Did you do it in some other code up here? Summary is plus sleep deprivation, plus sleep deprivation is means. Okay, so you're doing something up here. <laughs> SD positive, SD negative. Yeah, you're doing. Okay. Yeah, so my, so my problem is like for. Uh, like here, when I try to do like satisfaction of the uh, uh, like. C bind. When I tried to do this, it didn't let me. Get mm. there. It looks like it works to me, because we were, we have this right. Um, we've we've created satisfaction, but the reason this model's not running is because we don't we don't have sleep deprivation. So look, class dollar sign sleep. Oops. Uh, oh, 
null. So they're like it can't fit the model because it doesn't have the sleep deprivation variable. But you do create it earlier in the data set, so I'm just curious if it'll it'll knit and where it'll tell us it's getting a problem. No, no, it knit. See, so like when when you knit it, it runs all the code from the top to the bottom, right? But if you're just sort of working, so this is one reason I didn't want people to use Markdown is because when you're just working here, you you're not necessarily you don't necessarily have everything that you created above, right? But when you knit, it runs through all the code. But just because you're working here and on these objects that are in your environment here, doesn't necessarily mean that you're working with all the objects that you've got code to create earlier in the in the Markdown file. So all you would need to do here, I think, is just literally go back and run every single R line of R code from the top to the bottom. And then you should have sleep deprivation because you'll run that code that creates sleep deprivation. So when we, when we do the linear model, uh, what should the two, <coughs> like the two things here, should they be two columns in the data set? Yeah. Um, if you're going to say data is class, you need to use variables that are in the in the data set. Right? So this means the same thing as class dollar sign like sleep deprivation as class dollar sign. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll go back and try it. See if I can. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I was able to um, install, install the gplot. Oh, well, how, how did you get it? And I said, oh, but you, there is that little icon if you click specifically on our studio. And I just missed it. Yeah, I'm so sorry oh. for the stress. <laughs> no, no, show me in case I get this. Yeah, just again. in case. So if you do it here, it doesn't show up. Mm. But if you go to specifically our studio. Yeah. Okay, oh, there we go. So right here with a little. Yeah. yeah. Ah. So it says, like, ah. it's like go as an administrator. Okay. Yeah, but not in peer percentage. Ah. But anyway, if you do it like that, no problem. Great. In case it happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, Fantastic. Yeah. One okay. thing I wanted to clarify was uh, for SSE and SST. So I think I got the right SS, uh, SSE. Mm -hmm. I, I don't see it up there, but. Yeah, that guy. Just yeah. the sum of FB mod yeah. does Did you also get 58 point? Uh, sure. I think so. Yeah, 58.32438. Okay. Perfect. For the SST, I'm getting a weird number. Um, I don't think that's the one you got. Ah, right, right, right. So, probably just need to rerun this to make sure we yeah. have the correct uh -huh. Y variable. That looks fine. That looks fine. That looks fine. What's SST? It should tell us over here. Um, yeah, and now it's 60. So it was just, so remember, like, it was my mistake. So I used I used Facebook friends as my Y instead of open. Yeah. So here what we're doing is we're naming a variable Y, the variable we're predicting, the model in which we predicted openness through Facebook friends. Exactly, yeah. Okay, so, but why are we doing that? To create, to calculate SST, because SST, oh, SST, SST. Mm -hmm. SST what basi it basically means is all the variation in our y variable, in mm -hmm. our dependent variable. SST. Right. SST. SST, the total variation, total variation in our, in y, our variable. y variable, okay. right? And then SSE is like leftover variation mm -hmm. after we fit the model. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So this is why we need openness, because openness is our y variable. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. Um, so, I got a really weird graph. <laughs> oh, right, right, right. So you, okay, so you have, yeah, yeah, yeah. So up here it says you only need to put the prediction line on the uh, continuous model graph. Oh, you so don't need to do the other one? Yeah, you don't need to do the other one. Because uh, it doesn't totally make sense. Yeah, I was going to say. Oh, I'm still recording. Uh, well, are you guys, you're all going to be...